welcome. Good morning to everybody. Um, I hope everyone is doing really well at the moment. Obviously, really difficult times. Um, so please support yourselves, so look after yourselves, and it's great to see some of you here uh, this morning. Um, today's session is a CPD session for an hour with FA affiliate tutor Mick Bluin. Um, introduce Mick shortly. Just a couple of guidelines you saw a minute ago. Um, Everyone be on mute, apart from it'd be Mick mostly. I'll put myself on mute so you can't hear my squeaky chair. Um, if you have any questions during the session, um, please raise your hand. If you see me your name, um, there's a little hand raise. Um, I'll keep an eye on that. So if there's any questions, um, just put your hands up. Or alternatively, there's a chat function. If you've got a question there, also I'll, I'll monitor that. And um, if there's a question. Um, also an opportunity to ask questions at the end in the Q&A. Uh, meeting is recorded. And again, if you choose to use uh, video chat, just make sure um, people will be able to see it. And when it goes, um, hopefully upload it on YouTube, it'll be on there as well. So it's just to make you aware of that, really. Um, but yeah, morning, Mick. Morning, how, how are we? Everyone okay? This is good. <laughs> um, yeah, so Mick, you uh, kindly offered your services to do a CPD session um, at this time, which is fantastic. I really appreciate that, mate. Thank you. Um, should we begin? Yeah, let's get cracking. Let's get cracking. Good. Um, okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for listening this morning. Um, hope everyone's managing during this difficult time. Hopefully, talking football will cheer everyone up. Um, when I was asked to do this, I thought, what better um, topic to start us off with than, than finishing and how to coach uh, finishing in our sessions because, as we all know, football is all about scoring goals. Um, there'll be a few of you that are aware of the bits and bobs that come out here, um, especially if you've been on a level one of mine. I tend to use day two where we introduce game-related practices, um, all centred around finishing because, for me, it's the, the best demonstration, the best um, illustration of where we can go from a traditional drill that we'll go into in a bit and it, during the presentation and move it a little bit further into a realistic finishing session so that the involved actually get better at finishing linked to what they might have to do in a game at the weekends. Um, I find that this is the bit where coaches will have a bit of a hopefully a bit of a light bulb moment where they think, right, yeah, you know, that, that actually isn't particularly realistic or um, I've been doing stuff that maybe isn't the most helpful to the kids and then to move forward in this. So, uh, Rich, if you could go to the first slide for us, please. So what we've put together here, and this is a little bit of interaction for you guys, um, if you use the chat function for us in a minute, what I'd like you to do is just a couple of minutes, if you can, if you're on your if you're on your laptop, if you're not just listening, um, we just want to see where you scored your last goal from. So we've we've cut the pitch up there. We've got half a pitch. Apologies if there should have been a fifteen for any David Beckham's out there scoring in their own half, but um, we've got uh, fourteen zones on the pitch. If you could just put a number in your chat as to where you last scored a goal from, then we'll come back and we'll use that that area a little bit later on in the in the presentation. Eric B is a liar, as is Callum. Mike, why is a liar, Eric? <laughs> Explain, nine, eight, please. Nine. That's all. That's all. I'm only joking. One. Yeah, eight and nine, I think, most important zone in the pitch. Well, as in that, but is that where you've most recently scored a goal from? Well, not me, but the details in the game, when you analyse the details, let's say, from your teams when they play, most of the the, the, the finishing um, shooting zones is at eight and nine to be protected if if you protect that zone eight and nine, it's a basically basically it's a detail for the A license, and maybe you know that there's six zones, six uh, lines, six yeah. line zones. So eight and nine, it's most important when we protect it. I know we will properly the 
game with overload and attacking zone. But I think eight and nine is most important when we in the defense to be protected this zone. Okay. It's, it's my point. Is, it's my um, point. I'm not lying. I'm not lying. That you scored from. That's what I wanted to know, Eric. So the last goal that you scored, whether that's a, a so, kick about with your mates or whatever, yeah, where did so, you last score a goal yeah. from? So I've. I reckon my zone is our zone eight. Yeah, I'm a right footed and yeah. I've got a strong shot. So my weapon is uh, zone eight. And when you just uh, deliver and pass to me, I will be finishing from the zone eight. That's my zone. Okay, cool. Um, not to worry, not to worry. Um, so we've got lots and lots in there. As you can see, far in Eric, um, we've got majority. So we've got Eric and Callum in zones eight and nine. Everyone else is a four or five is the most common by the looks of things. And they've got a two or a three as well. Um, Mick, uh, one question. Basically, the zones, what we're talking about, is yeah. depends on the hours, group ages, what we're coaching and we basically playing. So the youngest groups, I think, finishing from the lowest numbers like a two three four five mm -hmm. my opinion the oldest groups up are 14 years old 14 years old he tried to you know build and be patient and the finishing from let's say four five eight and nine that's that's my opinion okay cool well we'll we'll get on to it i uh, every time you've got a little question or if you've got something you want to share with it let me know um, as we go through, okay, is that all right? Lovely, yeah, brilliant. Fantastic. Thank um, you. Rich, if you go to the next slide for us, um, when we when we go through this sort of stuff on courses, especially um, level ones, a lot of the time, um, we we look at um, what I've just described as probably a traditional shooting drill. There'll be those of you as well that have seen this sort of thing. Um, even even with top professionals um, trying this out before a game um, as a little bit of a warm up, what we're talking about is a shooting or finishing practice that is realistic. That's the key, realistic to the game, and the most beneficial in terms of how often it comes up. So what we've got here, and that. The question I, I want all of you to start thinking about in your minds now, and if you've got anything you need to contribute to it, either put it in the chat or if you want to raise your hand, there's no problem, is we've got um, probably a line of players in and around the centre circle of some description, obviously dependent on ages, distances might change. Um, traditionally, someone on the edge of the box could even be a coach, um, who asks for a pass, sets it off, and that player shoots. And as you can see, that player will be shooting from the edge of the box, um, depending on what side they go, um, zone eight or nine. Uh, you've got a goalkeeper in goal as well. Um, and players lined up ready to have their go. So what I want you to do is that have a little think in your minds as the chat's going on as to whether you think that is realistic whether or not you think that that is the type of finishing that players and for me this isn't exclusive to any age groups in particular this is overall uh, this is under sevens right up to first team level where are most goals scored from and does this sort of thing help now i've done this before where you ask you come up with um um where people actually come up with their own finishing practice. And what we what we end up with, you do end up with... Um... We're here to see Frank Cosgrove. Hello, Hello. who's that? Have you got someone in there? Nope, okay, that's fine, no problem. <laughs> what, we, what we have sometimes is little variations of this. They might even have two or three different lines of kids and you might ask to do different finishes and so on. But what I want you to do is just to discuss whether you think that's realistic. We've got a couple of questions. Who gets most touches in this drill? In my experience, the coast gets most touches. Should that happen? Um, really, really good point, Asif. Um, 
and something we'll come on to when you see where this is all all going to. But you're absolutely right, especially if that blue player in the middle happens to be a coach, then obviously they're not even getting um, uh, that a player's not even getting a touch of the ball in there. Elliot as well. Um, nice to have you on board, Els. You can show over Twitter recently. Most goals will be one touch finish inside the box. Um, I think you've been on a course with me. <laughs> Um, so you can see where this might be going. And David, probably the most outstanding point about this sort of thing, and it comes on to behaviour management as well. Not great on a freezing cold morning in January for the players, lots of standing around, couldn't agree more. Uh, Rich Earl's taking a break from Hoover in his lawn. If that was realistic, I'll just score lots more as a player. Correct, correct, Rich. Um, Rich Brandt, if you could go on to the next slide for us, please. There's an awful lot of things, hopefully, and those, those comments in the chat suggest that you are. Um, awful lot of points with regard to is it realistic? So in terms of your organisation, how many players are actually involved at any one time? Rich, can you just go back to the is it realistic for us? Thank you. Um, how many players are involved at any one time? And consider behaviour management. So, David, your point about not great on a freezing cold morning in January, those players that are lining up, waiting their turn, what happens to them? They, they, will, they will lose concentration, they'll become unengaged with everything they're doing and inevitably start to muck about. Um, where are they shooting from? Um, the distance and the position. So it's very similar. There's not a lot of um, variety in the practice, for example. Um, how many times does this happen in a match? Um, there's going to be, it seems like there might be a little bit of debate about it. But for me, um, and we'll come on to a few little stats that back it up. Goals are scored inside the box. It's sort of alluding to the second six-yard box where you've got your, your initial six-yard box, obviously, but then the line from there into around the spot, even to the edge of the box, if it's a little bit bigger. Those are the key areas. It was four and five in the, uh, in the diagram earlier. Um, how many different types of finishes does the player practice? Probably one of the key points of this is that that's going to be probably a laces shot. If you think about a power gauge in a car going backwards and forwards like that, your rev counter. Um, if we're going no power over here, and then this is max power, I would say that when that ball sets you on the edge of the box, everyone's power gauge is going to be down here, more than likely going to be laces, trying to go across the goalkeeper if you can. Um, and therefore, the, practice, the, the finish being pretty much the same sort of finish. How often does that happen? Probably happens. But what other types of finishes are there? There's no dink finish there. There's no side foot finish. Side foot finishes in different areas of the pitch. Um, the finishes that we'll come to as well with the practice we try and design, where it's messy, it's untidy. Um, it goes in off your knee, you get a stump to it, you get a toe to it, whatever it is. We need to practice because they happen. They happen regularly, um, even at the very highest level. How does the goalkeeper feel in this practice? Is it realistic for them? Um, I would imagine the goalkeepers um, stand around on that freezing cold morning, back to David's point, just picking the ball out the back of the net, or getting anywhere near it because the shot's been not been very good for them. Is that realistic for them? Do they Are they getting anything for, from that? Would they not prefer to be practicing the things that they need to do in the games? Um, uh, coming out at a player's feet, trying to spread uh, different types of saves, probably not going to get the second save, for example. If it is that they've made one save, are they saving it realistically? know that there's not a rebound there anyway so do they push it out wide or are they just happy for it to not go in the net in that instance um what type of oh we've got we've got 
Eric, give players freedom, be creative in this drill if you can do. Um, we'll come to something with that as well. As an under 10 coach, I use, but we always have two attackers and a defender positioned in the box. So we'll get to defenders in a minute, in a little bit. Um, we might, we'll cover it now. In terms of defenders, the thing about your finish and the role of the, the attacking players in that, a lot of the time you'll work off a trigger of what the defender's done. So even if you've got the one defender versus two attackers, issue with that will be that that, that defender's probably going to have to do the same thing every time as well. They're going to need to go half and half, look for... May, half blocking the shot, half blocking the pass, just in case the attacker passes to the other attacker. Um, so again, it's it's limiting what's actually happening and limiting the realism of what happens in a game. Um, a striker, for example, if there was a defender, if the defender runs towards you, you might think about either holding the ball up, you might try and go past them depending on how fast they've come towards you. Um, you would possibly pass if you feel like they've got it right. If they don't come towards you, that's when you're going to take a touch towards goal. You might shoot straight away, all of those things. So the defenders and the defending of it is really, really important on it. Um, if we go to, I'll cover decision making as well, which we've just done a little bit. Um, that's it's a great point. Again, the defender's position there is really, really key um, because you're just sticking them in a position and that's where they've got to stay. So, no, I agree. I, I'm, I'm agreeing with that. It wouldn't be, you wouldn't be in a realistic position. Probably wouldn't be that deep by himself if those players were the last players. Um, what size goal do you use is an interesting one. I know I spoke to an FA youth coach developer who works in the pro game recently. He did a, a little how often do we use goalkeepers and the appropriate size goals in practices? And it was 50%. It was half the time. So for half of um, practices in the pro game, for what this study looked at, um, players were either shooting in unrealistic sized goals or... Um, not even shooting in goals. Um, topic on this drill is finishing with focus on shooting or defending. Uh, interesting. Eric, if you want to buzz in with that, that would be interesting. I'd like to hear the question in, uh, in detail. Yeah, so um, thank you, Mike. Um, my, Mick, sorry, Mick. Uh, my question for this drill, it was basically for... Um, person, the coach who was put the defender details. So we focus, we focus on a finishing drill. Yeah, because yeah. the topic is finishing. Yeah. So when we focus on a coaching topic, we, we, we should focus on, a, let's say, less touches, your body shape, your balance. And uh, let's say if I've got a striker, always heads up to the end. Let's make a mistake. The goalkeepers, defenders, be, 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 little bit you know clever our every time think be creative like i says and when you give the freedom for your players he will yeah. tell you he will show you what you want how you want the the, the drill is very realistic for me on my point yeah. in a game in game scenario so um, what, what drill are you talking about are you talking about the one about, that I've just yeah, 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 yeah. That. yeah 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 about you about that's a drill that you would use yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, mm -hmm. the lines the set and, mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. and the shooting okay so very very basic you know and we're not bombastic. We're not looking something was is uh, difficult. We can be build progressive this drill, and they put one defender, two defenders, you know, and go two v two, three v three, whatever you want. Yeah. So the drill is very simple. I think give me enjoy think, it because do you think it's realistic? Do you think it replicates yeah, yeah, how yeah. players so play in a game? My question on the beginning of this drill it was which zones you see on that drill. Yeah. The finishing uh, zones on the beginning of your question, when yeah. we put the zones. So yeah. you can, all of you, you can explain and, 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 and answer yourself which zones you see in that, in that um, graphic, you know. So you've got probably, depends of you, depends of who you are in the pitch. If you feel yeah. in confidence, 
you can drill to the end zone and you know deliver the end product finished products from the last zones or if you you know if you've got from food you can finish right away from one touch so very realistic you can play stay, stay, stay where you are which Sorry, can you yeah. mind um stiff it, uh, nipping through a couple of slides and just get to the one where it's about the um the percentages of goals where they're scored we'll we'll go through and we'll come back just um just on eric's point here this is the one yeah so if you um eric if you just have a little look at that this is a study uh, the Premier League season is actually a couple old, but look for the um, the World Cup 2018. This is an, an analysis of all the goals that were scored in the World Cup. So the most recent World Cup. If you go down to the bottom bit where it says location of goals scored, mm -hmm. how many how many percentage of goals scored from outside the box? Yeah, outside the box, twenty one percentage. What about in the Premier League? What was the what was the goals? What was the percentage for goals scored outside the box in the Premier League? Premier League, uh, well, 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 yeah, thirteen. Correct. So the goals scored from inside the box is uh -huh. over eighty percent. Well, eighty around eighty percent in both instances. So this is this is what I'm alluding to at the moment is that there's a probably a a fixed mindset in our minds that we think um, when we practice shooting it joins eights and nines. But actually, when you look at the stats, if we're doing that, we're actually missing out on practicing where most goals are scored. Probably eight or nine out of ten goals are scored inside the box in those zones four or five as it turned out with us a lot in this meeting today as well it's probably about 80 percent wasn't it that said zones four or five mm -hmm. so that's what we're getting to but rich if you could just go back a couple of slides now that's perfect thanks for that. we'll we'll move back on to the um presentation if you go one again yeah So there's just those bits in terms of an, analyzing whether or not it was realistic or not. Um, we've got the, the just the practice spectrum as well. Now, for those of you that have gone on and done a level two, you'll um, you'll know and uh, be familiar with the practice spectrum when we go a constant, a variable, or a random practice. Now, it's just me as a coach and my experience, but I work mainly in random. For me, I find that it's the most realistic to a game. Uh, Rich, if you could go on one slide for us, please. There we go. I'll just give you a minute to have a little read through those, just in case there's those of you um, in the meeting that haven't haven't done the level two or not familiar with constant variable and random practices. Good. So just in terms of looking at it there, the the drill that we put up at the start would have to go into the constant um, bracket simply because there are no defenders. Now, I know a couple of you have mentioned defenders and it, that might turn into a slight variable if you create a 1v1 or a 2v2 or a 2v1 or something like that. What we're looking for, especially for finishing, and I'm not suggesting that constant and variable, there's not a place for that. So that's that's not what I'm saying at all. But we're looking at finishing and shooting. For me, if you look at that top bit where it says it's more unpredictable, it's opposed. We need it to be opposed. It's random returns. Good for long-term learning. This is mem uh, memory of finishing in certain situations. It's what we need. Um, it's um, wider tactical development. So those strikers are starting to, or, or the attacking players are starting to understand and finish in different areas under different circumstances, having a, having a knowledge and an understanding of what a goalkeeper might do at this point. Not having, um, not having any um, way of practicing against that takes all of that away. Now, the thing here that's really, really important is initially you're going to get some 
of success. That's fine. We need to be brave as coaches. It will probably look messy. Um, and I'll go into what I think is a good way of um, going about it um, just in a minute. So, Rich, if you could go to the next slide for us, please. I think we've probably covered this um, in terms of think back to the first slide. But, yeah, if we go on to this now and just take a minute to have a little look at those. There's the two key areas for me where we say... Um, where are most goals scored from? So where's the location of goals scored? We've covered that 80% of goals in that World Cup, you know, in the entire Premier League season, um, were scored inside the box. And then real key one for me, especially look at the stat in the World Cup where it says percentage of one-touch goals. Just taking the one touch, no time to think and Instinctive finish, 69% in the World Cup, 59% in the Premier League. So these are, again, sort of six, seven, eight out of ten goals are scored inside the box, one touch finish, no time to think. Uh, Rich, if we could go to the next slide for us, please. So how do we make shooting finishing practice realistic? For me, it's really, really simple have to use the game-based session. For those of you that listened to the pod on Thursday, um, we spoke a lot about it, myself and Mark Rivers, um, about benefits of a game-based session. It's hard to see uh, that there aren't benefits to a game-based session. In this, we need it. We need chaos. We need it to look messy. We need those players to be put under pressure and try to finish in the same circumstances that they finish on Saturday and Sundays when they play in your fixtures. And for me, the set on the edge of the box isn't going to achieve that. It doesn't achieve it. There's no chaos. There's plenty of time to take the pitch. We can understand that. And you might want to introduce basic shooting technique with something similar, but we're talking five minutes maybe. Um, and we must then get into practices that become realistic. Um, we want that chaos. We have to be brave as coaches that are points the session looks messy um rich could we go to the next slide please mate perfect i just put this up in terms of my planning um and what i normally go through in terms of the planning um so we've got what do i need to know before those are the bits you'll have in your journals at all the time um things like um Obviously, age range, space, equipment that you've got, all that sort of stuff. What's my objective to improve their finishing? How can I judge if the players have improved? Remember, sometimes that's not necessarily performance on the pitch. That's just we've improved their understanding. So just you players will have a, a better understanding of what it is they need to do to get better. Um, what topic, what type of practice am I using? Finishing is in, in possession, game-related practice, games based session. Same messages throughout the session. Everything will go from start to finish. Not going to change. Uh, setups the same. Um, there'll be lots of different coaching styles and interventions. When I coach this sort of session, um, I would rely on observational skills. So at times, maybe there's whole group interventions. You can do little drive-bys. You can talk to one player as an individual. Some of it's player-led because I might, um, depending on what pops up in the session, is give them um, a bit of responsibility and leadership and ownership on the scoring system. But I will have two little elements of the scoring system to get my topic out, which is really key. Uh, Rich, can we go to the next slide, please, mate? So what we've got here session plan there'll be i know mitch who's uh, logged in he's laughing at this he's seen me do this quite a few times uh, for those of you that have been on some of my courses this is one of my favorite practices to do um we have two two areas if this is um if this is men's teams you would use pitch is always double the size of the penalty box that that age group uses. So if you do under sevens, it's the same rule. It's double the size of the penalty box 
that that age group uses. So if that's set up in the middle of a pitch like that, you've got two areas either side of the halfway line that are roughly the size of a, of a normal 18 yard box. Um, the practice is easily adaptable to any sort of numbers. So there we've got um, 12 players. It's easily adaptable to have 14 or 16 if that's what you want. You can use a front three in there and a back four. Um, if you are doing your under sixes, your under sevens, you could have a goalkeeper and a player in each half. It's not a problem. Four or five players. You can use if you've got uneven numbers. You can use a magic player that can go wherever they want. That sort of thing. You can do whatever you need to do. Um, practice is as follows. You've got two teams. They are essentially playing a game. The goals are obviously relatively close together. If that's the if we're thinking um, first team or senior players, you've got. Um, Two 18 yard boxes so even the full length of the pitch will only be will still be a shootable distance um so we can get some of those long shots in in the practice as well um the players in each half are locked in their halves um so they're not allowed to move out we've got the dotted lines down the side where we've then got some channels on the outside practice starts just inside the dot dotted lines to start with and the channels become a progression later on in the practice so each team plays out from the goalkeeper, um, and at that point, I, I need to drive that this is a sh If on that diagram there, the, the red number one goalkeeper plays out to the, the red number five, and that number five has space and time to shoot, I want to encourage them to shoot. So those shooting from that distance is going to create in the middle the chaos that I want. Um, off both sides pitching quickly really important now my scoring system which i will introduce early doors first bravery points now what i've got here which i like is on the chat we've got elliot um defenders need to be motivated or it's not realistic couldn't agree more again in the uh in the drill that we looked at at the start you're going to end up with um even if you put defenders in that they're not going to be motivated it's it's um, a bit of the same situation as it was for the goalkeeper. They're, they're, they're trying to win the ball. When they win it, inevitably, you just ask them to give it back to the attackers. We don't want that. We want that element of transition. If you win the ball, you can do something with it. But in this, because it's such a condition, it's quite small, the defenders are going to need to be brave in terms of blocking shots, body on the line. So what we're actually doing is giving bravery points. So let's say, for example, the score is nil-nil, and that one passes to the red five. He gets it out of his feet and has a shot. The blue number four in the middle blocks it, and it's a brave block. Maybe it hurts, and you can tell that it was a, a real brave thing to do. Then I'd give the blues a goal for that. They go one-nil up. Um, the defenders have to be motivated, and we need to... We need to work and practice against defenders that are defending for their lives as if they were at the weekend in a game the other one is rebounds and this is this is the huge this is hugely important i'll be interested to know for those of you that are listening how often you see goals scored at the weekend that come from a rebound and that's why we encourage that red number five to shoot he shoots or she nice and early at that point that's where in the other half we create the chaos. Defenders aren't set, the goalkeeper's not set, and we're going to create the opportunity for a rebound or a deflected goal. So a rebound goal will be worth three. So it may be that that comes off of the goalkeeper and someone taps it in, be the most traditional type of rebound, that's fine. Uh, that would be worth three. But if it comes off the post, the bar, if it hits a defender, um, hits another striker and comes back and you score from that, they're all worth three. Because those are the realistic goals that we see scored at the weekend. Those are, the, those are the realistic goals that we see on Saturday and Sunday mornings. They're the ones where you need to be instinctive. You need to react quickly. Um, I'll just give you a couple examples of how the how the practice progresses. So, Rich, if you go on to the next slide for us, please. The game is played in the exact same way, and we've still got the bravery and rebound points. Um, 
is one of the players who you would have down as defenders to start with, but when they're in possession of the ball, they're on the edge of their own box. They're sort of midfielders shooting. Um, what we have at that point there is one of them can go and join the attack. And say, in terms of player ownership and decision-making on the pitch, not a case that the one, so say there, the, the arrow is coming from the number four. If the four plays in, it's not that they have to join in. We could have the four plays in and the five makes the run. The four can actually just dribble over the line and join in that way. Um, the only restriction on when one can join in is you have to have the ball. That's it. So um, you can't drop a defender back in and help out. It's for that late run. Now, what, what you'd hope to achieve with that is that you might get the slightly later runs and the and the finishes from that four and five zone again. If play has gone towards the goal, you might get the, um, I'm trying to think of an example at the moment, but it would most certainly be the Gerard Lampard arriving late on the edge of the box or just inside the sort of thing. Penalty, penalty area, um, penalty spot finish, really. Um, so that's the that would be the first progression. Um, again, that's lo lots of coaches will often shout um, communicate, communicate, but they have to communicate now, don't they? I would say if um, if they score a goal with too many players in the area, it won't count. So if they've got it wrong, if the four plays in and the five joins as well, it won't count. You must rotate properly. Um, good. Rich, can we go to the next one for us, please? And then the final progression just brings in the wide zones. So the wide zone... Um, you don't have the halfway line restriction, so you can enter it in your defensive half and run all the way up. You're allowed one free touch before a defender may come in and engage you. The idea for that would be to promote, if you can get yourself in the right position, a first time early cross. Um, but after you've taken that first touch, you know the defender might come in. Now, the defender might not come in because they might want to stay in the area. The other great thing about this a little bit of responsibility because you can now have one of your players that would be part of your back three for example in the wide area crossing you can still have one come in and join in as well to make a front three attacking the cross which leaves you a little bit exposed at the fact 2v1 so what's nice about it is as well is that you might also have that one eye on the counter attack for the opposition um, there's so many things that come out of this practice and hopefully there's been a few little moments and questions that you've got so rich go to the last slide for us there we go it's just a case now of um getting you guys involved um i've done enough speaking so what do you think what are your thoughts has anyone tried it has anyone got any opposition to it um Time to just have a chat about football, really. Thanks, mate. Brilliant stuff. Um, if you guys just have a raise a hand or type your question uh, on the chat, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll here we go. One, well, I'll mute myself over to Richard. Oh, I'll unmute you. Um, hello, everybody. Is that is that Richard? Is it? It is indeed, mate. Hello. Um, oh yeah. How's that lawn of yours? Oh, do you know what? You've got me so engrossed, I haven't even tried yet. <laughs> um, I, I took part in this drill, as part of drill, sorry, my practice as part of my level two with yourself. And more than everything you discussed, it's great fun. It's chaos. Yeah. Um, I'm sure Elliot and the other guys will agree. It was, it was great fun. We, we all learned so much, but it was, it was just a, a player's practice. How many different types of finishes were there, Rich, in there? Like when you when you got when you got into it, when it really got off the ground and tried going, how many different um, how many different types of finishes were exposed to? Uh, well, uh, every, as many as you can imagine. There was you have you had the boys at the back who were having the long shots, the rebounds, or all sorts of parts of the foot. It was everything and everything. Side foot laces, yeah. instinctive. We lost Rich there. Hello. Hello, Rich. You still there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Effectively, all types of finish yeah. from all sorts yeah. of angles and. Absolutely, absolutely. Good, good, good. So we've got. Um, do you want to get Asif in and let us know how it went with his with his lot? He's obviously tried it with his players. 
Hello. Hello. Hey, Steve, how are you? I, yeah, good. Thing. Yeah, no, I was just saying. Um, I said on the chat that yeah, I've tried a sort of basically the same game, but just using the uh, the eighteen yard box. So you've got the goals really close. Literally every time. What is that for? Um, it varies. I've done it with the even with adults. Uh, okay. Sort of going down to sort of. Uh, you know, 10, 11 year olds, uh, where they're yeah. using, like you're saying, what they would normally use as their uh, goalkeeper's area. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like you're saying, loads of really instinctive finishes where they haven't got that time to think about it. They've literally got to um, try and do something quickly um, as soon as the ball comes to them. Um, but you, also, um... in, terms of in terms of defenders, it gets them thinking about. You know that every time someone gets the ball, they're in a dangerous position. Yeah. They're having to close that down really quickly as well. Also, they they can be thinking about the next step. So, um, if the defender wins the ball, immediately they might be able to score. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you get that element of transition. There's a, for me, there's nothing worse than when you watch a session and a defender wins the ball, and they're either asked to hoof it out or just give it back to the attackers. So in this, there's a motivation to win the ball so that you can attack. One thing I was going to say to you is, um, so you've actually, in terms of um, just using the 18 yard area, I've seen it done before as well. One thing that was really great was um, have corners or throw-ins in the normal way. Basically, if the ball goes off, it's the first team to get it and take the kick in back in. Right. Yeah, I've even what done like does, a... Yeah, oh, sorry. it keeps it going really, really fast again. If you do sort of five minute intense of that you get a, a huge tempo utter chaos um but it's brilliant and that you'll get all those different variety of finishes again yeah i've done something like yeah where you've got loads of balls in the goalkeeper's net yeah um sorry in the goals <laughs> yeah. and uh what happens if you if you shoot and you miss you go get the ball yeah so you, you almost got that overload you know, temporary overload, underload situation as well. Absolutely, yeah. You don't have to manufacture it. It just happens because that's a game. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, Rich, should we go and have a, a chat with Gabor Please. about um, constant practice and, and the random element of it? Absolutely, Gabor. We've got a hand up as well, um, which we'll speak to in a minute. But yeah, here we go, Gabor. Hi. Uh, How are you? I'm very good, thank you. How are you? I'm enjoying the, the sessions. Um, so normally when I, when I deliver a session, I normally start, if I want to teach like switching play or finishing or part ones, defendings or attacking, I start with a constant session to teach the basic and then I progress in a random and variable uh, practice. And it helps a lot, teach them the basic technique of it and then put in a random uh, session afterwards. What age group do you coach? So I coach Newport Park under 11s and RTC MK Dons on the 14s. So I, I think that um, certainly uh, for um, foundation phase, uh, you can really, there's a, there's an understanding of why you might try that and start with the constant practices. Um, some of them need that basic element of explaining the skill in a sort of isolated way. So whether that be finishing or whatever. Um, I like in your message though that you've put for five, 10 minutes, because for me, that's the, that's, that's how long you should really look at that before you get them into something that's going to help them match related. Um, so yeah, I've got no, no problem with that. As I said before, in terms of practice spectrum, constant's there for a reason. It can help out, but for me, it's the one that you probably the least um, might be. Do you use it, for example, as an arrival activity as well? And normally my kids will start with the game straight away, especially the foundation phase. So if they work on passing and receiving, if they score a different type of, from different part of a the foot, they get different points. So instead of working on passing and receiving. So if you set up a player, you get two points or three points. It's different, different session, different topic. But at this, this age, foundation phase, I'm five, 10 minutes, a constant session after the arrival activity. If they have a game for 10, 15 minutes, and then they have a constant session and then work in the variable and the topic as well. Perfect. Good, good, good. Nice example of using practice spectrum. Thank you for that. Uh, Rich, oh, Rich we got we go to the up? hand up now. Go to the hand up, Mick. Here we go. It's HP. Hello, HP. HP. 
Okay. Hello. Bye. Uh, no, we'll give them another chance in a minute, but uh, Elliot's yeah, next, yeah, I think. We... Elliot, perfect. Hello, Elliot. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, Elliot, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Very good, very good. I've, I've managed to get through to you this time. Apologies <laughs> for, uh, apologies for this time. <laughs> <laughs> um, Go for it. What, what do you want to ask? I was just going to say um, that... Uh, you're doing it within a game you yep. can still coach the technique because obviously like you said there's going to be loads of finishes so if somebody does something for example you receive the ball on the left hand side <laughs> and you open your body up because the game will naturally force you to have to do that and you put it in the corner rather than just saying good finish you can stop the session and go right just go roughly put the defenders back where they were and say why did you choose that finish and then you can you're teaching the technique, but then you've got the communication from the environment, so then they can go, right, that's why they've used that technique. Because if you're teaching it in isolation, it basically has no transfer to the game because there's no information from the environment. You may think you're teaching them technique, but it basically, isolated technique, in my opinion, is a complete waste of time because as soon as you go into a game, that technique becomes irrelevant. So that's why it's good to do it within a game. Well, let's use the example of the finish that you just spoke about. You're on the left-hand side, you cut inside and you curl it with your right foot. Is that what you were alluding to? Yes, yeah. So obviously the defender's blocking your... Blocking so your there's, there's the key. There's the key that you've mentioned straight away. The reason that it becomes far more realistic and better than your isolated practice is because when you're doing that finish, what are you going to use? Inside your foot, an instep. You're also going to use that defender, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're using them as a guide. You know you, the, the defender dictates really or your little movement of the ball, your shift of the ball beforehand makes that puts that finish put, uh, makes that finish realistic for you, doesn't it? It yeah. makes it, it, it dictates whether it's on or not. Because if they're in that perfect little position where you know you cannot miss the defender, it's got half a chance because it's going in that it, in the corner. Yeah. Um, so what's the defender doing for the goalkeeper in that situation? Blocking his view. Blocking their view. And so if you can get, if, you, if that can be as early as possible, which will then go into being able to coach how to set someone for a first-time finish yeah. um, beforehand. If it can be a first-time finish, you've got the defender doing, blocking the goalkeeper's view. If you get it round them and the finish is perfect, then the goalkeeper's got very little chance, have they? Yeah, absolutely. No, it's a great point. Recreating good examples, something I think you'll probably remember, I'm quite big on um, in terms of uh, coaching. We tend to focus too much on, right, stop there, that wasn't very good, we need to do this, and all that sort of thing. Sometimes it can be demotivating, sometimes we have to do it, but um, very powerful if you can recreate something that's gone well. Those kids that have been involved in that particular example buzz in, they want to do it again. And the other ones want the same sort of level of praise that you've given as well. So great points. Thank you for that. Uh, Rich, Thank you, Elliot. Questions? What else have we got? Going to Eric. Oh, Eric, here he comes. Hey, Eric. Hi, guys. Thank you. Eric, um, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, guys. I hope you're right as well. Difficult yeah. time, a little bit to be coached, but we keep going. Um, my question What's, about... What are your thoughts then? So, uh, back to the beginning of my questions, you know, for me, yeah. this is the small side game. And uh, great point, um, maybe you or someone says before, um, don't coach them too much. Let them play, give them freedom again. Um, a lot of trial and, trial and error, um, you know, game scenario. Again, we created uh, some, you know, s finishing situations. And uh, like I said, we can play one, two touches, you know, like, uh, let's say, academy level, want that, you know, receive it, finish. Um, and we can change, again, the session design. Someone says beginning to make them motivate the defenders. So on my point um i will be give a little bit changes for the session design and i will be added another two goals for this for the defenders okay but in, in what regard so so defending team what would they get, yeah. two, what would they get two goals so for? so let's say we we give the overload for the attackers attacking team 
and we give the extra goals for defenders. Mm -hmm. So defenders got totally, let's say, two or three goals and one goalkeeper on the attacking team. Are you saying, sorry, are you saying they start, the defending team that are outnumbered, they start two or three nil up or... Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so let's say the, the defenders play with, uh, let's say, four versus five or four versus six. Depends, yeah. of, depends of you. Depends what we're looking for. And it's and... Like a goal at each end. We've just got an outnumbered game at the moment. Yeah, yeah okay. so the attacking, the attacking team with overload got one goalkeeper. Defenders got one goalkeeper. And the attackers yeah. need to defend, let's say, two or three goals. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that we try to make work hard defenders to add it around, like I said, two or three goals. I think yeah. defenders will be get the massive challenge to be impact and uh, win the ball, keep the shape, let's say, stick yeah. together, you know, compact defense, blah, blah, you know. Yeah. So, um, yeah, quite interesting game, I think. It's a, it's a quick game, small side game, a lot of touches. One, the thing two touches. for me is... Um... I'm a simple person. For me, on a Saturday, me too. Sunday, me too. Uh, me too. Um, Saturday or Sunday, you, you start with equal numbers. Um, you start at nil nil. So for me, I would have that in in sessions. I understand why you would go overloads, underloads at times. There's there's reasons for it, especially in that um, in the variable element of the practice spectrum. Mm. You might be using that sort of thing. But Maybe that, I got yeah. to. Go on. Maybe I go too far on the beginning because uh, when we be built progressively the, the session, we can do the, you know, overloads or, you know, yeah. the, the numbers of the overloads of the one of the teams this way or that way. But yeah, it makes sense that what you said. I'm, I'm, I'm quite similar like you. We start in the basic bar when we want to build the session, yeah. you know, maybe, you know, a little bit, give him more, 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 something, a little bit change the design the session. Why not? Yeah. We can, we can try, you know, be creative again. Keep it simple. Some message from me, Eric. Yeah, yeah. Rich, where are we off to next? Have we got any more any more questions? We haven't at the moment. But if someone wants to, uh, we'll try XP again. I think Elliot's got his hand as well. HP, are you there? Hello. HP, are we there? Uh, no. Um, Elliot's got his hand up. Elliot, hello. I was just going to say on the, the last point about the overloads and underloads, normally when you are attacking, you would actually be, uh, the defenders will have the overload. So that might be something to consider. Very, very unlikely that you're going to have a 4v2 in your favour in the last, unless it's a counter-attack. Most times strikers might receive the ball with two centre-backs around them. So they might have point. something even on their when own. You're even when you're counter-attacking, that would be, the state of the game would be different for that. Um uh, for me, so if you if you found yourself counter attacking three v two, it's probably because the opposition are chasing the game yeah. in some way that you're unlikely to be counter attacking three v two very often. So I, that 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 for me, it, the overloads and undernodes for me are small moments in games where if you recognise that you're in an advantage position, then that's when you can take advantage of it. Um, I'm not, I I don't often. Um, Apart from maybe like a little arrival activity or something, I don't often have a game where there's one team heavily loaded on the other one. Yeah. yeah. No, great point. Um, we've also got um, a seat again. I like the question with um, what do you think about setting points for different finishes? Is a seat? Should be. Oh, yeah. Geez. Yeah, I'm here. Hello, mate. Yeah, it's just a, uh, you know, like I said on the, on the chat, it's uh, I've I've seen it where coaches are trying to set people individual challenges, maybe, and saying, okay, you can only shoot with your left or uh, things like that. But then, are we by doing stuff like that? Are we taken away from the realism? You know, if the ball's on my right, I'm yeah. going to shoot with my right. Um, well, you're, you know, the the key is to reward and not restrict. So. Um, you have, you, you could well have a player that you want them to work a little bit more on their left foot, for example. I would never restrict them to only using their left foot. I would just reward them for using their left foot. So it might be that you can say to individuals within there, if you score with your left foot, it's worth three. But if you score with your right foot, you still get a goal for it because 
it might be that at a particular moment, um, it was important that the right finish was with your right foot. So you don't want to take away, it's a little bit like that, um, 10 passes before you can score or whatever. Well, what if, what if you're in front of goal ready to score after three passes? You don't want to make it unrealistic like that. So try to remember reward, don't restrict. Um, if you want a particular player to get something out, in, in, encourage it, um, reward it. But I wouldn't take away elements of the game for that benefit. Right. Um, last couple of questions. It's conscious time. Thanks, and Steve. Um, oh, no problem. Bjorn. Bjorn's got a question. Uh, hello. Hello. Is that Bjorn? How you doing, mate? You're right. Very good. How are you, mate? You okay? Yeah, I'm not too bad. Yeah, it was just um, I didn't see the start of the session, so sorry if you covered this already. But should there no be problem. a minimum or a maximum amount of players you would have in this session? One, one of the good... from ten players to eighteen well, sometimes. I think um, you can. What what age group is it, Bjorn? Uh, Twelve's going to thirteens next year. So you're playing nine v nine, is that right, or are you on to eleven? By the time we start again next season, it'll be eleven aside. Yeah. So even if you had your eighteen, then you can still section that up and have nine v nine in a way, um, because it's not unrealistic to what they're doing. You might need to consider the the size of the pitch, and you might need to extend it just slightly. And if you add your 10, then that's that's easy to use it for as well, because you can have a goalkeeper, you could do three defenders and one striker, or you could do two in each zone and do it like that if you wanted to. Um, if you have uneven numbers, you can just use one player as a magic player. They can go wherever they want, um, and they're on the team that's that's got the ball. Um, yeah, quite one of the things that's nice about doing games-based coaching is that, generally speaking, your session will be adaptable to um, whatever numbers, as long as you've thought about it beforehand. Yeah, no, all right, fair point. Thank you. Perfect, no problem. Thanks, Bill. Um, and final question of the session, uh, Bob Ryan. Hello, Bob. Hello, Bob. You there? Hello, hello. Hello, mate. Can you hear me? How are we? Can Eric? I'm yeah. just going to mute you, mate, just because I can hear stuff. Here we go. Go over to you, Bob. Yeah. Um, so my question was really around um, uh, basically designated areas in the goal. Um, you know, I, I a lot of my boys were under 13s. You know, they're after that glory goal most of the time. Um, so you know, generally that glory goal ends up at keeper's favourite height, really. Um, you know, um, so... Are we talking about a designated area within the goal in terms of, um, you know, your top corners, bottom corners, that sort of thing? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Sort of extra okay. points, goals, It's whatever. very, very, very similar answer to um, the previous one where you just want to maybe reward and not restrict. So it might be that... Um, I've, uh, I've got some pegs in my coaching kit and I sometimes peg bibs in the top corner and if they hit the bib, then they get three points for it. But a normal goal is still worth one. So it might be that they go for the top corner and that's where your observational skills comes in as well. If it is the case that they went for a top corner when actually it would have been easier to go elsewhere, that's, that's the perfect point for a little... Um, maybe a little bit of drive-by coaching, some Q&A with them. What made you go for that? Where could you have gone? Where was it simpler to go? What type of finish could you have used? Those sorts of things. Great, thank you. No problem. Thanks, Mick. Not a worry. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Mick. We'll uh, conclude there, mate. Well done, by the way, Mick. Really, really good. Considering the... Um, First time you've done that as well. That's really, really good, mate. So thank you very much. Thanks for all the no questions worries. as well. Enjoyed it. Very good. Good, mate. Excellent stuff. Um, just going to uh, just tie it up now quickly, just to let you know, we've got a podcast out. Series two is just finished. Um, available on all good um, devices. Um, some, some 12 episodes there. And I'm just going to mute Eric. Right, there he is. Um, so, yeah, please listen to that. Talking tactics, we've got a mental health program. <laughs> he's interrupting me um so yeah talking tactics mental health programs uh this friday they've taken it online so scott davies there ex reading player um talks about um gambling addiction and offers advice on mental health as well which is fantastic um 
and uh, just what's coming on the next on the online program. No worries, Eric. By the way, um, in twelve minutes, there's a coaching Q and A session. So see it kind of like a surgery. So if you've got any questions, um, I'll be on there. Mark Rivers, our CCD, will be on there, and Mitch Woodward will be on there. Who, um, like Mick, is an FA affiliate tutor. So if you have any questions about your grassroots team or um, about just football in general. Um, please uh, dial in there. Our details details will be on the um, on the uh, website, um, and there's other stuff as well. So there's a game review on Tuesday, one o'clock till two. If you want a bit of respite, um, dial into that, and we'll have a look at that. But please me to say thank you to everyone who's dialed in. Thank you again, Mick. Um, thank you very much to everyone. Great in. Yeah, brilliant stuff. Um, it's great. Yeah, that respite. Just have that hour away from uh, normality um, and we'll continue to do these. Um, so if you uh, if you sign up or join the link live, that'd be great. Um, so yeah, 10 minutes, we'll do the coaching Q&A. Hope to see some of you there. If not, enjoy the rest of your days. Stay safe and um, speak soon.